That one wants to be stubborn, doesn't it? Good morning, morning. and welcome to the house of the Lord on this um, beautiful Lord's Day. For those of you that are in-house, those of you that's watching by Facebook, we uh, welcome you and and, uh, we appreciate you tuning in and being a part of all that uh, God has in store. And I've got a message up here that I can preach for 8 hours and 26 minutes before my mic runs out. Bernie, I'll do my best. Uh, You just don't know. Okay. (laughs) So we appreciate everybody coming, and we hope that uh, uh, you are blessed. If you have any announcements you want to uh, bring to our attention, please, if you will, make your way to the front, and I will make sure to give you that opportunity. But uh, first things first, I want to do this up front, and uh, it's a special occasion. I want to recognize Mr. Franklin and Ms. Francis. I'm sure they're watching by Facebook. Everybody, just, uh, just out loud, just wish them a happy 55th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 55 years. Uh, And like Mr. Franklin shared in his state, Ms. Francis, we're praying for you. We really are. We love you both. (laughs) uh, uh, So if you get a chance sometime on Facebook or what have you, give them a call and and let them know that you're thinking about 55 years of uh, a wedding. So we, uh, we just uh, want to celebrate that and recognize them this morning. Uh, also, we, wanted, we weren't going to have pictures, but uh, uh, me and my computer just did not get along. Uh, and it may have something to do with not getting much sleep Friday night, too. I'm not as young as I, I used to be. And I told Reed that I'm not old. I'm just not as young as I used to be. <laughs> but uh, we'll have some pictures of our lock-in uh, from Friday night next week. And uh, we, had, we had a good time, didn't we? Sarah and, and, and Seth, we appreciate uh, Gabriel, uh, Gail, and, and I know I'm going to leave somebody out. There's a, there are a lot of folks that done a lot of work. Kendall came out uh, to, to get the food together, the, the games, and uh, uh, we appreciate everyone that worked and put that together. And I uh, had a guest speaker come in, and he shared a... A devotion, and, and, and uh, in the midst of all, I did learn something Friday night. Uh, I learned a game called Among Us. The interesting thing is, as he was saying that, I was trying to figure out if he was saying fungus or comicus or whatever. What was he saying? So I had to Google. Now, y'all, y'all got to know I have learned over the years how to Google things. So I Googled for a game that had imposters, and there it came up. And it was Among Us. It weren't fungus or it weren't nothing. It was Among Us. So I began to read about the little game and what it was about. So it had on there install. So I'm going to figure out what this thing is. Now, I won't be, I won't be up with you guys. You know, I won't be there. And, and I clicked on that little thing. And those of you that have done this with apps and everything, and speaking of phones, let me turn mine off before it starts going crazy. Um, you know, when you hit install and it comes up open, it's already on your phone. And I hit that install button and it came up open. Come to find out, Reed has been playing that game on my phone. And I didn't even know it was Among Us. You know? So, so uh, okay. <laughs> We, did, we had a good time, though. Uh, we, we really did. Uh, we even threw some ice cream and cookies in there at them and wondered why they didn't go to sleep at 9 o'clock. But anyway. uh, <laughs> in fact, there were some that didn't go to sleep until 4.30. I know that for a fact. Because <clears throat> I was drugged kicking and screaming at 4.30. And anyway, uh, we, we did. We had a good time, and, and uh, we appreciate the... Uh, the parents for letting the kids come out, and uh, I think they enjoyed themselves, and uh, there's some of them here. How many of you are at the lock-in? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you were at the lock-in and would admit that you were like at the lock okay. But uh, we, we all had a good time, so just ask them. Uh, they'll tell you they, they, they did. They had a good time. We had breakfast. Uh, Seth and Gabe and I fixed uh, breakfast. They had coffee. 
Praise the Lord for coffee for some of the folks, and, and uh, we're, we're glad we're able to provide that. But then the next thing, and we're going to move on to the next thing, and the next thing is uh, we have a youth retreat planned, and out, uh, outbreak, why do we want to call it outbreak? Breakout is into its, uh, going into its second week. Uh, we had our first week, the, the past week on Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night, will be the escape room portion of the breakout, and we hope that you'll come and be a part of that. If you did not attend this past Wednesday night, that's okay. We'll give you a chance to get caught up, and uh, we'll go into the escape room, and hopefully you can find your way out. Now, parents, don't send your kids if you don't want you know, anyone. Uh, we, we do want you, we want your kids to get back to you, so we'll, we'll get them out of the room one way or the other. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to that. So if you have any questions about breakout, you can see Sarah or Gabriel, the one, and they will uh, point you in the right direction. We'd love to have you. It starts at 7 o'clock, so do come on Wednesday night to be a part of that as we move along in, in, in that area. I also want to remind you of our Sunday school and, and our worship time each and every week. We encourage you to come and uh, plug into that and be a part of what God's doing there. Okay? Uh, is there any other announcement? Oh, ladies' retreat. Gil asked me to, to touch base on that. Uh, the ladies' retreat taking place at the end of this month at Cragmont. Uh, it's a little camp uh, there at uh, Black Mountain. We're headed that way at the end of the month. If you'd like to go, ladies, if you'd uh, be more than welcome to come, but you need to see Gail and uh, get all the details about that. So uh, keep that in mind and be much in prayer uh, for that activity. Okay? Any other announcement? <coughs> Nothing. Y'all quiet. Y'all are really quiet. <laughs> kind of worries me. <laughs> but uh, well, let's not go into our time of worship, and uh, we're going to do so in, in prayer. And, and uh, as we do, I know there's many that uh, need a prayer, and uh, those that have been spoken of already, uh, we do want to remember them that's on the prayer list, uh, lift them up, and uh, lift the service today, our nation, and uh, so many, many other things. Uh, to be prayed for and lifted up, but they're uh, uh, by definitely an uh, outspoken request, and we're going to start here on my left. If you have a request to be made, Ted, we'll start with back here with you. Okay, Mr. Rick. Yes, I was Susan got to have sinus surgery, and in this month, remember her. Okay, remember Susan, Sarah. My daddy and mama. I remember Chris and Beth. Any others? If not, run right over here. Any request for prayer? Yes, Ms. Carol. Continue to remember Tina Bass. Yes, absolutely. Lisa. Lisa Black. Okay. Black. Mr. Darrell. Mr. Darrell. Yeah, remember Mr. Darrell in the family. Okay. Any others? Yes, Um, uh, Praise report. Um, a friend from high school, I think we've asked for prayer for her baby before baby Inslee. Mm -hmm. She was in the NICU for 55 days. She came home this week. Oh, oh my goodness. Wow. They've got to do close follow-ups for her kidney function, mm -hmm. but it's a miracle that she came wow, home. Wow, that's great. Yeah, we've uh, been following that. I didn't know. Praise the Lord. Any others? <laughs> yes. Let's remember all of the members and people of the church in our community sometimes not everybody tells you what's going on with them and so if we remember that they have a problem and there's not a one that doesn't have something that they need to go to the Lord in prayer for especially me yes uh, my mom's family um, they had a death in the family it's like her second or third cousin um, committed suicide last week and mm -hmm. their whole um, the wife and he had a twin brother and they're just they're all you know have the, the normal questions of why and mm -hmm. and um, yeah. but if you just pray for comfort for them absolutely Tim Fountain yes Tim Fountain any others as we uh, go to the time of prayer I'm going to ask uh, Gable would you come and, and lead us in this time of prayer and as he comes Again, remember the continuance of the service today. I remember our nation and the situation it's in and the chaos and the confusion that surrounds us. And uh, pray that uh, we as a church would continue to live in the name of Jesus above all things. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come here today, Lord. Lord, we just give you all glory, honor, and praise, Father. You're so worthy of it all, Father. And Lord, all these needs that have been brought to you today, Father, we don't know all the needs that they have, but Father, you do. Lord, I don't know if it's spiritual, emotional, physical, Father. I just pray that you be with every single one of them, Father. You provide for what they need. Lord, I just pray that you be upon the message today, Father, whatever that may be. Lord, I just pray that that message, your word, moves among this congregation today and presses every heart that's in here, Father. For we all need to hear what you have to say. Father, and for us not just to keep that message within inside of us, but Father, for us to take it outside of these walls, take it to this world that's so dark right now, Father, and so desperately in need to hear some good news, Father. We see all this bad news going on whenever we turn on our TVs or we just walk outside, Father. But Lord, we have some good news. We have good news to know that we have a Savior that lives. That Jesus, while he was killed on the cross in Calvary, three days later rose, and he's alive today. And that this world has hope because he's coming back one day. And Father, I just pray that we just spread that news out to this world, Father. Let those that feel like they have no hope, give them that hope and give it to them in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I just pray that you be with us, guide us, and protect us every day. And we ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. that we don't know where the answers are. <laughs> As we were talking about earlier in the days and the times that we live today with the COVID, with our nation in stress and torn, and we just don't know where the breaking point is. <sighs> we go out on our shopping sprees. We take our families from one place to another. But the bottom line is without God's amazing grace, where will we be? Where will we find ourselves in today's times? But I, I like the last verse of this song, Amazing Grace. All of, the word, all of them are good. But you know, it's, it's the promise of God. And by His grace and His mercy, one day we'll experience for all eternity what He has promised. So let's sing that last verse together, just like you meant it. When we've all been there 10,000 years, what? We'll just be getting started. And we been there ten thousand years. God's people said? Amen. 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 <laughs> Children's church, you can be dismissed at this point. And uh, you can turn your Bibles to, to the book of Haggai. That's uh, in the Old Testament. If you uh, run into the book of Zechariah. They need a little extra time to find Haggai and what? He could also find Ezra. He, he's just about as hard to find. We're going to have a quick time of prayer over our youth. I, I think that's a appropriate. That Sarah's asked for that. And not only children's church, but school and whatever. 
whatever that looks like in your life, uh, if you're in Bula, uh, Duplin County or if you're Onslow County or something, I don't know what school looks like for you, but, but let, let's pray a, a special time of, of blessing on them. Aren't they a good looking crowd? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do ask. Um, as our heart goes out to our kids, uh, we love them. Lord, we pray, Father, that you put a hedge of protection around about them. Lord, the, the viruses that are out there, COVID, and the different sicknesses that comes along that affects our kids in so many different ways. We ask, Father, right now that you would protect them. Uh, shroud them with your presence and with your spirit. Walk with them. Protect them from harsh and harmful words, from those that would mean harm. We pray, Father, that you would protect them. And Lord, we place them in your hands. Father, as parents and as grandparents, we can't be there all the time. But Lord, we know you can. And Lord, we pray that you would bless them, keep them. We pray, Father, that you would raise them up to be mighty in your name. And we do ask it in Jesus. Amen. 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 Y'all go have fun. Learn. Pay attention. Don't give Sarah too hard time. All right. The book of Haggai. <laughs> in chapter 1, if you found that particular passage of Scripture, let me uh, kind of set the scene just a little bit before we get into our text. And, and, and this morning we're, we're going to look at uh, the, the text, kind of not verse by verse, but pretty close, in, in the midst of, of what is taking place in Haggai. But before we get there, uh, the nation of Israel had been taken into bondage by Babylon uh, 70 years earlier, actually, do the math, 85 years earlier. Uh, but they were in Babylon for 70 years in captivity, and Babylon had came and destroyed Israel, torn down the temple, left it in ruins. And in the midst of the 70 years, the different prophets that came along, and, 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 and then we find here in Haggai that they have been out of captivity for 15 years. God had led them out of captivity of Babylon, and they find themselves back in Israel in the midst of what was going on. Now, with that said, we have those things called alarm clocks. They wake us up from our sleep, from our slumber, and remind us that we've got to get up and live life. Now, we do ignore those alarm clocks. It's called a snooze button. <laughs> who, who is it that came up with a snooze button? You ever thought about that? Yeah. Who? <laughs> a genius. <laughs> But, yet, but we, do, we ignore those alarms when they go off at times, and we kind of push them off to the side so we can, can get a little extra sleep. And, and, but eventually, we have to get up. The alarm gets us and wakes us up, and we get out about our business and, and get about our, our days. Well, God had alarms as well, and they were called prophets. He had prophets that comes along to sound the alarm for people of God to, to awaken from their slumber and to listen to the voice of God. We come to Haggai, which was one of those prophets, and, and to give you a little bit of a, a biblical lesson here, or a, a, a Bible class lesson, if you will, we, we all know there's major and minor prophets. Uh, the only difference between the two is the major prophets had more words to say than the minor prophets. There are bigger books that are major prophets. Uh, the, the little prophets, the minor prophets, uh, said what they needed to say in a lot less time. Okay, that kind of sums it up. Haggai was a minor prophet. You flip the page, you're done. Uh, that's, the, that's the alarm. That's what he did in the midst of God's alarm and God's warning to his people to wake up. So, so let's take a look at Haggai and, and, and keeping in mind those things which are in, in present. They're out of Babylon. They're out of bondage. They've been so for 15 years. And beginning in verse 1, it says, In the second year of Darius the king, it says, uh, In the sixth month, the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord. Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zebul the son of, of Shetiel, or so there's pronounced different ways, but that's how I do it. That's how it comes out. Governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest, saying, "Thus saith the Lord." Verse two of hosts, this people saying. The time is not come. This is what the people are saying, okay? The time is not come that the time of the Lord's house should be built. 
Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, It is time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed house, and the house lies in waste. May the Lord. We don't have time. That, that's basically what is taking place here as we read in verse 2. God says to Haggai, the, the, the people just don't have time for me. Here they have been back for 15 years. They've got their houses. And the Bible later on says that they run to them. They're, they're excited to get back home. They have their houses. But my house is laid in ruins. Now, 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 that's significant, especially in the Old Testament days and today. The temple represented the very presence of God in their life. And here they have been out of Babylon, been out of captivity, back home in Israel. They've built themselves houses. They've clothed themselves. But God's house has been unattended to. And the people are saying, well, we just don't have time. Oh, folks, today, we hear it so much in, in our, our societies and our communities today when we start talking about the church, but we just don't have time. I can't serve because I don't have time. I can't build up God's house in my community because I don't have time. I'm building my careers. I'm building my house. I'm clothing my family. I'm doing my thing. I don't have time for God. I want his blessings but I don't have time for God. I want to enjoy the thing that God's given to me. I want to enjoy all of the things that surrounds me. But God, I don't need you right now. I only need you when 9-11 comes around. I only need you when Katrina comes through. I only need you when storms raises up. I only need you in the time of death or time of sickness. Then, God, I'll call upon you. Then I have time for you. And then, God, I expect your blessings. You can either say, oh, my, or amen, one or the other. We just don't have time for God. And that's basically what the people were saying. And Haggai comes with this message and this alarm in verse 3. It says, then came the word, Haggai the prophet, saying, it, is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses? And this house, God's house, lies in waste. Now, now just a side note. It, it amazes me how sometimes we cringe to spend money on God's house. And yet we make sure we have brick houses to live in. That's just, a, I'm not going to charge you a penny for that one. <laughs> it just, it's just is. We, we want our, and I've, and look, I've seen y'all's landscape yards. And we grumble when we got to put a little bit of straw around the church house. We don't want pretty flowers around the churchyard because they're high maintenance and nobody wants to take care of them. But I've seen the ones at your house. We don't have time, God. I want my sealed house. I, I want my house remodeled. I want my house taken care of. But God's house, you know, uh, let's just let's do the bare minimum. Now, and you can ask those that's on the general board. We met... And, and, and look, you ride by out there on that road as you hear the vehicles passing by. Bethlehem has a beautiful campus to look at. We do a good job with what God has given to us. So don't, don't get me wrong, but there's so much more we could do if only we had time. If only we put God in the right perspective in a way that, that God would have us to look to him, that this is his house. This is a place that God has put together for us to come and meet him and dwell with him and have fellowship with God's wonderful people. I love seeing your smiling faces. I didn't realize how hard it was for, for the, the, to preach to a camera. And it stares back at me like I'll stare at me, but, but I know there's life. <laughs> I know, I know there's life behind that stair, but that one I just don't know. 
this is God's house. And if we want to be revived, if we want to experience the movement of God and the blessings of God in our life, we need to understand that God's house, we need to make some time for him. Not just his blessings. Because Haggai goes on. And the second thing, not only do we not have time, and and he says here in the next thing, uh, in verse uh, 5, Now therefore, he says, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Oh, my goodness. We can go to meddling and quit preaching now, can't we? Consider your ways. Now, he mentions this. This this comes up again. He says it again in verse 7. Consider your ways. In other words, God wants you to think about some things. And he comes to Haggai as an alarm to his people to tell them, you need to think about what you're doing. Listen to what he says in verse 6. You have so much, but you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled. And you, with drink, you clothe, and, but, 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 there's, but, but there's no warmth. He goes on in verse 6, says, And you earneth wages, and earneth wages to put them into a bag with holes. Oh, can we get a, a testimony, you know? We're working, we're laboring, we're cl- but we don't. We we eat, and we're still not satisfied. We're still not content. We drink, but there's still not enough drink there to to cover our sorrows. We well, we make money, we make more, we make more, but we're just throwing it in bags, and there's just no hold. That you just we're doing all of this stuff, but we're not content. Paul says that I have learned, and notice the word learned, because. Contentment is not natural. As a baby, when you're born into this world, you're never content. Moms, can we get an amen there? You're never content. You're always crying for something. Whether it's a bottle or whether it's to have a diaper change or wanting to be played with. You're always crying about something. You're not content. Paul says that I have learned whether things are up or things are down, whether things are prosperous or not, I have learned that in Christ Jesus to be content. Mm. So if the stock market is down or if it's up, If you consider your ways and if you have put God in right perspective, he is in first place in your life, you could be content. You could be content in the midst of the most chaotic of circumstances because your circumstances is not your God. You've put God first. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But in the midst of, he's done all of these things. The Lord says, consider your ways. Uh, Then he comes to verse 8. Verse 8 says, go up on the mountain and gather wood so that you can come back down and work and rebuild my temple. Now to chop wood, back that that takes work. Has any of you ever in this day and time chopped a tree down with an axe, and I'm not talking about the one with the motor on it. <laughs> I'm talking about with an axe. You don't. That's not easy. Now, those of you, some of you, raised your hand and said you had cut a tree down with an axe. Did you do it without sweating? You were probably ready to sit down and relax just a little bit after you got done chopping down a tree, especially one of any significant size. So, so Haggai was telling them, look, you've got to get up to the mountain. You, and so you've got to climb to get up to where you need to get to, to get the good trees, to cut them down and bring them back in order to bring the temple. But then there comes this matter. Wait a minute. Now, some of the old timers here in this particular passage, in this particular time that is sitting here in Israel, that has been out of Babylon for 15 years, knows what took place back in Ezra. Ezra says that before they left Babylon, and you can go back and look at it in Ezra chapter, yeah, 
Um, there's not that many chapters. You can find it. Um, that's audience participation. Um, Ezra chapter 3, and, and I think it's in, in, in somewhere around verse 6 or 7. God provided all the things. that They provided everything the carpenters would need, everything that the masonry people would need, everything they needed, including the cedars of Lebanon to build his temple. They had the wood. So God, why are you telling me to climb up the mountain and cut more wood to build the temple that we've already got wood to build the temple with? Why are you telling me to do all of this work to climb up the mountain to cut down the wood when we've already got wood? Because the wood that God blessed you with, the goods and the blessings that God gave you 15 years ago to do what God would have you to do, you've put in your houses. You've remodeled your houses. You've put panels in your homes. You have provided and taken the grace and the goodness of God and benefited yourself in my house, lays in ways. Consider your ways. You want to be revived? I promise you it's not going to come through somebody coming and preaching for an hour and a half for three nights. You want to be revived? Put God first. Consider your ways. The Bible throughout, is there is a common thread that runs throughout the text to put God first. The Bible says that if you're going to tithe, according to Deuteronomy, you're going to give the first fruits of your labor. And you're going to give God first. The New Testament says that Jesus is the first resurrection. Revelation says that you have left your first love. Throughout text, we are told the first things. And the first thing that we should consider is our relationship with God. Where have we placed him in our life in relationship to all the blessings? We love the blessings and ignore the blesser. Where is he at? If God is not first in your life, you're going to experience moments like this. You're going to have plenty. You're going to earn money. You're going to clothe yourself. You're going to have food to eat. But there's not going to be contentment because God is not first in your life. Consider your ways, Haggai says. Consider the way that you're acting. Consider the way that you're living. You took the blessing and the goodness of God and you spent it on yourself. Now you're going to have to work even harder in order to please me, God says. Listen to what he says in verse 8. He says, go to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. We want to please God? Use his blessings to glorify him. Did you hear me? Use your blessings to glorify him. To please him. We ought to get up in the morning to think, what can we do today to please God first? Then throughout the day, I can enjoy the blessings of God. We're having a bad day. We think, well, man, I'm down on my luck. No. Luck don't have anything to do with it. You want to know why? Look at the verse 9. It says, And you every man run into his own house. My house lies in waste. But you've taken my blessings and you have provided for yourself that which is pleasurable and enjoyable and you want to get there. Verse 10 says, Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. Verse 11 says, And I have called... 
for a drought upon the land, upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which is the ground, bring it forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labors of your hands. God says that if your fields are not yielding their fruit, don't blame the soil, blame me. If the things in your life, if your cattle is not producing, blame me. I'm the one that has caused it to drought. I'm the one that closed up heaven. Throw it at me. I'm the reason why you think you're down on your luck. You've removed me from first place in your life. You've taken my blessings and spent them on yourselves. Then I'm going to cause all the things that are around you, I'm going to close them up. And you're going to begin to wonder why all of these things are happening to me. Oh, woe is me. My fields won't produce. I I can't earn enough money. I can't eat enough food. I can't drink enough. I can't do all of these things to find contentment. And you're going around and blaming mom and dad. You're blaming your wife, your husband. You're blaming your employer. And God says, stop. Look at me. I'm the one that caused all these things to shut down. And until you put me back in first place, until you renew your spirit and come back to a right relationship with me, you're going to continue to live in drought. Haggai says God has closed all these things up but if you want to enjoy the blessings of God you've got to please him first all God's people you need to know today we can't spend the blessings of God to benefit self and expect God to continue to bless you it don't work that way consider your ways God says I brought these things about they're happening because I'm in charge Look at us today. January, February, March of last year. If you look at the world economy system, America is rolling forward at $23 billion economic economy. Far surpassing anything else in the world today. But God said, I can shut you down. Overnight. God said, I can shut you down. You want to know where revival begins? It begins right here, recognizing and considering our ways and realizing that the blessings of God will only be sustained when we put him first. When he's out of first, everything changes. I remember when Katrina came through. Go back. Look at the news. There was a lot of rhetoric taking place across our land. Black versus white. Rich versus poor. Then God called Katrina. And in the days following Katrina, it didn't matter if it was a black man saving a white man. It didn't matter if it was a poor man reaching out to save the rich man. We were all in it together. I witnessed it. Going down to disaster relief, I, I witnessed families that had been broken and hadn't spoken to each other in over 10 years. Working shoulder to shoulder to rebuild. You see, when God's not first, he can speak in ways that causes man to fall to their knees. Haggai was that alarm clock to wake the people up, to get them to understand the reason by which they find themselves struggling and hurting is because they need a revival. They need to come to the place to understand that his blessings is not just one recreational day after another. But his blessings, listen to me, his blessings are given to us in order that we can glorify him. That that's the reason. God doesn't bless you with a, a big bank account in order that you can walk around and say, I'm on the Forbes 500. 
God gives you what he gives you in order that you can be a blessing to someone else. A few years ago, it's been several years ago now, the church I was pastoring at the time was buying a new digital piano. And we come up with an idea that we were going to sell keys to that piano. And I forgot it how much per key. See, I, I, I want to say $100. $100 is a good round number. I, I might can do the math on that one. And, and anyway, we decided we were going to sell keys. And it was kind of coming down to the end of the, the program. And we need to get the piano paid off. And, but, and, and we were... We couldn't find 88 people with $100 to buy 88 keys. So we were a little short, and, and we needed it, it was coming to an end. And, and we were having a deacon's meeting one night, and, and a businessman, a local businessman that had sat down with me a couple of weeks prior, and we had prayer together. His business was not doing well, and, and he's thinking, well, I might have to shut the doors. And, and he, he was in financial uh, burden. And he came into the deacon's meeting, and he said, guys, um, I wanted to buy the rest of those keys. And I said, I think there was about seven, eight hundred dollars left. He said, I, I want to buy the rest of those keys. I don't want a whole lot of people to know about it, but I, I, I want to buy those keys. My first response was to jump up and say, Man, you I, I know where you don't need to do that. But God in his amazing grace got a hold of my tongue before I said what I wanted to say. And I sat back and, and let him do what God had impressed on his heart to do. And as he wrote out that check, and he handed it over to the deacon board, and he turned and left, he turned back around and he said, Guys, y'all know me. He said, I've spent a lot of time making sure the outside of my vessel looked real good. And I'm trying to quote him the best I can by memory, but he said, I, the outside of my vessel looks real good. He said, but God shone light inside my vessel, and I was ashamed to see the crud and the ugliness that existed inside my beautiful vessel. He said, two weeks ago, me and him, pointed to me, had prayer. And God went inside my vessel with a wire brush and cleaned me out. I've just got to bless him and glorify him with what little he's given me. To God be the glory. And he turned around and left. Chairman of my deacon board, and he had a he had a 30-minute devotion he was going to give. <laughs> Never happened. But God began to renew that man. And we thought he was a good man before. He'd done a good job cleaning the outside of that vessel. But you know what? When he got the inside as clean as the outside, we began to see what kind of man he really could be. He began to bless God. And to honor God with everything that he had. And God, by his grace, turned his circumstances around. I'm here to tell you today. If you would allow God to clean the inside of your vessel as clean as you try to make the outside. God can change everything. We all wear masks. A long time before the virus came around. We need to be real with God. Consider our ways. Consider how we're treating God. Come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And allow God to cleanse the inside of our vessels. That we could become the people of God. That we could be. Yes, it's going to take some work. We're going to have to climb the mountain. We've already used the blessings that God provided us with no labor. Those things which, which was given to us 15 years ago, the best would, the best opportunities. God's blessed us, but we've used those blessings. God's put us in a place now we're going to have to sacrifice and work and labor in order to do what God's called us to do.
It may not be easy. You might be sitting here today and you've dug yourself a pretty big hole. And you can't get out of it alone. Turn your heart towards God. Call on Him today. Put Him first. Return to your first love. Return to the blesser, the giver of all things. And allow Him the opportunity to have a, an audience with you in worship, in work, in family. And if you're not doing anything but going out there and kicking the ball around the yard, let God be there. Let Him flow through you in everything that you do. That His blessings might please Him. That's what He wants. That's what He desires. And that's our mandate. Is to bless and honor God. You want revival? That's where it begins. And I pray that in our heart as a church that we would get a hold of this. So much so that by the time that our series of services comes around in March, that we'll be so filled with revival that we'll see this place filled with people seeking to be in the presence of God. That we can see souls saved. I, I, we've been in a dry spell. I, I want to see some souls brought to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm tired of seeing Satan win the battles. I'm ready to win some for the Lord. But in order to do that, we've got to be revived. We've got to be blessed by God in order that we can please Him. I'm ready to win some battles. How about you? And I think that it comes by coming to in the, in the very presence of God to be renewed, to be revived by Him and using His blessings in the way that God has given to us to use them. Oh, we're 15 years into it. And we've used all of the wood. We're living in good houses. Now we've got to go to work. Now we've got to do something with what God has given us to do. That's where you find revival. Are you ready for that? Do, do, do you really desire to be revived in God? So that in the midst of all that takes place in the world, the world may be falling apart. But if you've put God where he needs to be, and you've been restored and renewed in his goodness and his grace and his mercy, you can have contentment when everything else is in chaos. That's how I face the morning. It's a scary thing. I was telling Brother Murphy. It's a, it's a scary. I don't know how people who don't know God gets up in the morning and face what's in front of them. If I didn't know God, I believe I'd be cowering in the midst of the Smallest closet I've got with the door shut. But I know God. <laughs> I know God. And everything that is bad, ugly, and different, and everything that causes so much chaos is prior to the little word called but. But God. How about you? You want revival? Put God first. In the midst of all the blessings that God has given to you, consider your ways and put God first. And let Him brag on you a little bit and continue the blessings that He has for you. Someone said and asked, you know, what would I do if I, if I won a million dollar lottery? What would you do if you won a million dollar lottery? First of all, you got to play it. You'd probably do the same thing with a million dollars that you do with five. And if God can't bless you with five, 
He's not going to bless you with a million. Again, I think I've said this before. I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. I'm teaching obedience. When God has blessed you, he didn't bless you just so you can live at a higher standard. He blessed you that you can bring pleasure and glory to him. And if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times this past year. We are to glorify God in all that we do so that we can benefit others. That's what it's about. That's where revival begins. It's to enjoy the blessings, but return the praise to Him. If we can get that into our hard-headed brains, and don't tell me you're not hard-headed. I know most of you here. <laughs> if we can get that, God could change everything. And what could we do in this little community if we as a church could go to the place where revival begins and put God first? Oh, man. God would have to build another building to house the souls that we can bring in. The hurt, the broken, that is laying tattered and torn because of Satan. And God could use us today to be the salve to bring healing to that broken. Mm. Don't want to get too much in next week's message, but God wants us to be the healing influence. That sin is broken apart. And it begins by putting God first. And everything else, God will bless. I believe that. With all of my heart, put God first. I want to ask you to stand. And as we close this service out, it is by God's amazing grace that we are saved from the wretchedness of sin. And folks, you may be standing here today, you may be looking by Facebook, and, and you think, well, I just got a little bit of sin. Well, if I was to offer you a glass of water and I just put just a little bit of poison in there, would you still drink it? It's pretty lethal, dude. Pretty lethal. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but regardless if I put a lot or a little, you know it's harmful, and you're not going to drink it. So it doesn't matter. Confess it to me. The Bible says that I'm just, and I'll forgive you of those sins. Praise be to God that he forgives us of our sins. Our thoughts, as well as our deeds, God forgives all of our sins. And maybe you're here today and you have sin that needs to be confessed. I want to ask you if you would just bow your heads for just a moment and close your eyes as we go together in prayer. And if you're here today and you're a sinner and you know that you've never made a profession of faith, why don't you step out and come? That this might be your day to say yes to Jesus. Repent of your sins and turn from your wicked ways. Maybe you're here today as a child of the living God and you know that you've used his blessings to benefit self. But today, you want to turn all that to Him in praise, in thanksgiving. As we pray, would you just lift your hearts to Him and, and just, just praise Him?
In Jesus' name, we thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. Forgiveness of sin. For an opportunity to come together in your house. We thank you for your blessings. And as we leave this place, we pray, Father, that we go with anticipation to do that which you have placed us here to do. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you leave, there's one thing that just come to my mind. And I, and I have to share it with you freely. Saying what's in your heart's one thing. Oh, it's okay. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. That's good. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Oh, that's wonderful. We might even run down the aisle. Jump a pew. We've got some medics in the building. You know, We might say all of those things and it looks good. Sounds good. Oh, God, you're so high, I can't get over you. So wide, I can't get around you. So low, I can't get under you. That sounds good. But you know what? If we're going to have to climb the mountain, we're going to have to cut some wood, we're going to have to break a sweat for the glory of God. It's not just in what we say, but it's interpreted by what we do. You're at liberty to go in the fear of God. May God bless you. Say hello to someone. Give them a high five or elbow bump. Or look, if you love them, you might even want, I'm not going to encourage them. But God bless you. <laughs>